Gwilym, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm good, good. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. You look like you're sat in some large throne. Where are you? I'm sat in some large throne. No, no, it's uh, one of the strange, we've got all kinds of modern shaped pods in our office now. I mean, oh, is this, the, is this these kind of like noise reducing things where when you're sat within them, you're meant to be like um, inaudible to people outside? I think so, except that there's a window here bouncing all my sound over my head to the entire office. So everyone's going to get one quarter of a podcast. Ah, but, so you've, but you've, you've got a load of legal text behind you. Is that CEPA stuff? Can I see like the black book and stuff like that? It's RPCs, but we have got the CEPA transactions somewhere as well. It's all the stuff we kept when we moved. Our, our kind of office designers said it'd be quite cool to have a little section with all the old books in. And they were right. It is. We've also got... It's amazing what you find when you move offices, isn't it? Well, we've also got, um, for patent uh, case law aficionados, I can see from here the original No Fume Ashtray, which is a very famous 1930s case. Oh, 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 Bruce's given, Bruce given away the game that we've got guests by um... him. <laughs> it's the original No Fume Ashtray from the case law, which basically set the scene for functional claiming, as still found in the European patent guidelines. So there we go. How, how amazing is that? There are no cigarette ends in it. Sometimes guests come and say, is this a smoking section? <laughs> no, it's just an exhibit. <laughs> when, we, when we moved super offices, we stumbled across the old original charter, which is now obviously proudly displayed, as it should have, as it should have been. But it was it was it had been um folded up and put in a metal box down in the basement, which was damp. And um and we stumbled across it and I opened it up with trepidation, thinking, Oh, what state's it gonna be in? It was pristine. It was um it was perfectly kept in this old metal storage box. And um is now proudly displayed in the in the I was going to say the new office, but we've been there nearly eight years, so it's not that new now. I haven't. Is it still fit for purpose? Out of interest, does it still reflect what we do? Well, we we've had sort of six or seven supplementary charters yes. and two new charters. Yes. So yeah, so, so I mean, some of the wording obviously flows through from the the very beginnings, but but yeah, no, it's been updated over time. Most recently in um, twenty sixteen. I mean, I obviously know that because I'm a long-term council member. You know, yeah, and, and you worked on the um, bylaws review, so you know all of that. Oh, happy days! Yeah, should we crack on, mate? Should we get? Yes. We get how we get the guests on? Yes. Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. So we're we're going to have a fascinating insight into the world of. Um, as I understand it, teaching IP in non-IP contexts, so t- t- teaching IP to people who, for whom IP will be extraordinarily important, but they don't know it yet, which must be must be a difficult task in and of itself. We have Ruth and Sabine on with us. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So, Ruth, do you want to um, do you want to go first? Well, yes, I'll go first. I'll say that I am Ruth Suddendorp, and I've been involved in the IP education world since the middle. 1980s, which is... I, I thought you were going to say 19th century, then. that would have been um, <laughs> extraordinary, wouldn't it? it feel, sometimes it, it feels like that, it feels like that. <laughs> I've been privileged to witness the growth of interest in IP education, both from the students, or mainly from the students and from the recipients, and a little a bit less so from the people who are supposed to be teaching it. But it's been an exciting adventure. I spent most of my academic life in Bournemouth and uh, was part of Bournemouth University uh, establishing the Centre for Intellectual Property Policy and Management, which is a well-respected uh, research centre which continues to flourish. Even though I left Bournemouth about 16 years ago. And in my semi-retirement from Bournemouth, I joined City University as a visiting lecturer and have enjoyed uh, working with undergraduates and postgraduates, not in the law school, in the business school, and bringing intellectual property concepts to them. And it was only in the last uh, two or three years, in in the memory of COVID, that Sabine sought me out and together we have uh, bonded over the book that we're going to be talking about today, which is Teaching Intellectual Property Law, Strategy and Management. That's me. That's you. Ah, thank you so much for coming on. A return, should I say, Ruth. You've been on before, so um, so you're a friend of the show. Oh, thank you. 
Thank so you. Sabine, t- tell us all about you and why you went in search of Ruth. So uh, thank you for having us. So I'm Sabine Jacques. I've recently joined uh, the University of Liverpool as a senior um, lecturer in intellectual property law. Uh, this is actually my first month on the job. So I also have uh, moved office recently and still very bare right now. But uh, yes, I've joined, but I was previously at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, uh, where I've been there for seven years. And this is uh, where the research has uh, taken uh, shape uh, for, for this project. Um, so uh, I've had less experience than Ruth in IP education, but what I have witnessed is that our classrooms are very different and they keep on changing and the expectations from students are changing as well. And so we wanted to kind of look at these changing expectations, not only from the students, but also from the IP educator, as well as uh, future employers, and bring a lot of collaborators together uh, to share best practices in terms of teaching IP in and outside the law school. Um, I must say uh, I'm remaining a visiting scholar at the University of East Anglia and I'm also a visiting lecturer at the University of Maastricht where there um, I have the privilege of teaching on an IP program where the the classroom is a mix between lawyers and people coming from different scientific backgrounds. So everything has to be taught from this double perspective as well. Thanks for that, Sabine. And we probably ought to get all of our um, academic credentials on the table early doors. So, Gwilym, you're you're, you're not unknown to the world of IP law teaching, are you? Thank you. No, I am either a visiting or an honorary professor. I can never remember which at Queen Mary. I'm sure you guys know the team there really, really well. And so, yeah, actually, I'm really interested in teaching IP. However, I've only mostly taught it personally to people who, A, are in IP or want to get into IP, and B, are interested. <laughs> I think I've had quite an easy ride. The one time I taught externals, as it were, was actually was at Bournemouth, Ruth, several years ago, where I, you guys were running a course between the law and the engineering group for undergrads. Yeah. Yes, and yes. it was really exciting to go and talk to my IP, but oh my goodness me, I didn't have the most interested. I mean, normally I, I lecture people who want a job in IP, so they're all desperate and they give me their card afterwards as well. This is a different dynamic that I had to learn how to manage. It was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I, I'll just fit, um, add on, um, Lee, that I'm still an emerita professor at uh, Bournemouth and Associate um, Director of SIPM. But the last autumn, I finished a three year term as a visiting professor uh, with the Arts University of London. And that was a really uh, interesting experience, although it was sort of riddled with COVID, but it was uh, it was very interesting. And I think to just to sort of bounce back to Gwilym, the research sort of has brought it out that, that we did six years ago. The students, by and large, are interested. If you, if you found the students uninterested, that's um, that, that is unusual. The, you know, well, well, it was me. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> Before Lee says it. <laughs> it was going through my mind. <laughs> Um, no, by by and large, I think Sabine will will agree as well that once and one of the things we found in um, in the work for the book is that uh, it's engaging the students, it's getting the students to overcome this morbid fear of the law if they're nothing to do yet with the law academically and intellectual property. Once you can get them over that fear, then they are interested and engaged. And that's what we hope the book will help people do. Ah, but before we get into the book, um, I probably ought to say I used to teach plumbing. And I that, that's killed the podcast. No, no, no. I'll, I'll add to that. My when I wanted to become a teacher in university, I had to do a, a teacher's training course, and the only thing on offer in Bournemouth at that time was in the Further Ed College, where you were learning amongst tradespeople. And I went oh, the best, the best with, people to learn with. Oh, well, I went with my sort of nose in the air. I just come off with a law and politics degree, and so on. I found it the most fabulous experience. The hairdressers and the plumbers. And the electricians that taught us were amazing. And did, what did, did, you, did, did you get to experience a lot of vocational micro teaching, which which is where it when you probably wasn't called that in those days. But go on, uh, explain what you mean. Uh, so we we used to pitch up, and we would be required to do to prep a lesson of like three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. So you had to take something from your vocational area that you could teach to your kind of fellow trainee teachers. Uh, so it might be something like I, I might have done rewashing a ball valve, right. 
or um, a chef might have bought in a set of knives and quickly filleted a fish or something like that. And it was yeah. it was amazing because you've got all of the all of the active ingredients of prepping a lesson, but in that sort of like micro um, micro experience. Right. Lee, I've got I've got. Can I do the end of um, podcast question, please? Oh, I've got one, but you can. Yes, yeah, so okay. can we have one each because I know what I want to do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can always edit that bit out so it sounds all sort of like natural at the end. <laughs> Ruth, Sabine, where should we start? So where did the idea, so should we say the research first? Because I, I imagine the research predates the book, does it? There was a package of research in this that probably the book is the end product of, yeah? Obviously, uh, Ruth has a wealth of experience in, in, in IP teaching, and so her reputation uh, did precede uh, her. Um, so we met at the uh, European Intellectual Property uh, Teachers Network in, I think it was 2017, if I remember correctly. And there, I was very much the newbie. Um, I was trying to, uh, well, I did present. I was not trying. Um, but I presented a, a board game that I had devised uh, for, for my students to help them revise uh, IP concepts uh, at their own pace, but also with immediate feedback and also trying to get some kind of collaborative element so that we would also grow a community within the classroom uh, at the same time as they were able to kind of follow their own learning journey on an individual uh, level. So it's very much, you know, a simple board game with a lot of the rules that they would have uh, learned from um, other games uh, when, when, when they were children, perhaps, uh, or, or still uh, as teenagers or adults for those who like. Uh, so, so does that look like any other game we might know? Is there anything we can kind of there is there is a board to the game with like there's, there's it's monopoly board. isn't it it's monopoly no, it's, it's not it's that's not. a that is a good name for an ip based <laughs> board game by the way yeah, very much so uh no Monop- there is a, Monop- there monopoly p you know i can't do it but no, sorry carry on yeah okay so there are elements that you could say you can find in the monopoly game for sure um but there are also uh, uh tips uh, and and tricks which wouldn't uh, be in there so basically just to 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 cut the, the the story short and for everyone to have an idea as to what the game uh, actually is about, students enter a classroom and they're as soon as they enter they're put into a situation where they are at a at a, an IP exhibition and they have to present their own project as well as trying to find new color collaborators for future projects. So they sit around a table and they have this progress board in front of them. They do have to draw cards at their, well, in turn and answer a question, but they are also like surprise uh, uh, cards. So um, for example, they can just receive money to put into the bank for a future project, or they might have a threat. And this is some kind of industrial uh, espionage uh, that's happening with in the game so there are some 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 additional features like this but the basics of the mechanics of the game is indeed there is a board you progress as a single player um, however because i wanted this collaborative element as well and the idea also is to make sure that no one just wants well um kind of wanders off and 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 doesn't get what they want from 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 the from, from the game to keep people motivated, basically. Um, if if someone cannot answer one of these questions, then they have to answer um, um, in a team. So they have to work together to kind of find the answer and to keep everyone motivated to kind of progress all together. So um, this was the idea that I was presenting at this conference. And then I had lovely feedback from Ruth uh, and, and her support had been amazing. Um, Somehow, I'm not entirely sure, uh, Edward Elger, um, so the, the publishers for, the, for this book, heard about, uh, about this project. And they have this lovely uh, series called Ed- Elger's Guides to Teaching. And it's all a series of, of books looking at ways in which we can improve our teaching of a particular subject. So this is not about the contents, it's about the how we deliver um, a particular um, piece of knowledge. At the time um, when when Edward Elger uh, approached me, I thought, well, I can't do this on my own because I'm not a representation of, you know, the best IP uh, teaching practices that are out there. That's completely uh, not correct. And so I thought, well, it would be great to bring 
uh, Ruth on board to help me edit um, this book and to just gather um, what best practices we find, what we found innovative in terms of IP teaching that could help educators, whether they are based in a law school or outside a law school, to um, teach perhaps differently. Um, and um, and yeah, instead of reinventing the, the wheel, it's about sharing. Okay, shall I add to that? Bill yeah, Anna? please do, please do Ruth. Yes, okay. Well, I think uh, Sabine's given a very accurate picture of how Edward Elgar was int intrigued uh, with the idea of uh, IP teaching and thought of the book and approached her. And I'm very you know, flattered by the comments she makes about my wealth of uh, IP teaching uh, experience. But what I was thrilled with the opportunity to work with Sabine on was the opportunity to get across yet again what I've been banging on again about for over th three decades really, which is um, the, the approaches that we make when teaching IP law outside the law school, which for lawyers certainly and law teachers certainly involves a different thinking, a different approach and a different understanding of really what's required. And I think the key word that came to me uh, in retrospect, having worked on the book, is diversity. And I think what the book is doing is it's representing uh, a diversity of the circumstances in which people may come to intellectual property, a diversity of institutions in which they may find themselves learning about it, a diversity of deliverers, their backgrounds and who they are, and a deliver diversity of styles and a diversity of, obviously, in the students themselves. And from Taking account of that, and I think if you look through, if we have a, if you're interested, so that we look through the way the chapters of the books are organised and the authors that we involved in uh, contributing to the book, that diversity is reflected. And hopefully, our hope, I think, is that anybody faced with the prospect, like Willem describing, you know, teaching the engineers uh, at Bournemouth, with the prospect of teaching IP to non-lawyers, will pick up the book and see in that diversity something with which they can identify and resonate and something which triggers them to think afresh. So whereas I don't come to the book, I mean, I was bored in re reading the contributions, the diverse approaches that people take to IP teaching. I'm not nearly as creative as most of the uh, contributors, but I kind of permanently find myself motivated by this desire to engage and to take on board you know, where I am, who I'm in front of, who has come to me, my class for, for IP education. So from a simplistic point of view, you've got a topic and you've got an audience and you've got to get that topic to the audience. Simplistic, you think, oh gosh, there's one way of doing that. But what you're suggesting is that there's a whole bunch of different approaches. And obviously, the board game is a great example of something that certainly would have occurred to me. What are the what are some of the other kind of themes? What are the approaches that you come across? I'll start. I'll start with my with with my most recent thing of, of the last few years is what I've called IP icebreakers, which is going into the class either in a seminar or a tutorial with a snippet from um, a media source that the students would have been familiar with, but it's not necessarily anything to do with law, but it's to do with media or things that, things that they are interested in. And it would be a snippet perhaps that brings up a, a, a dispute, a story, something that's been threatened with legal action or is going through the courts, but hasn't yet been decided. And giving the, that to the students to read and to comment on, and telling them, look, whatever you say can't be wrong because we haven't got a decision on this yet. Just think about it. What's your gut reaction? And getting the students to speak. Once they've spoken once, I don't know if you realise this yourself, but once a student speaks once in class, they'll speak again. And often the hardest part is getting them to speak the first time. So they read, for example, I, I picked up um, one item of a woman who sat next to somebody in an, an aeroplane who was watching a film on their phone. And she realized that this was a film in which she had a role and which she had some sort of kind of ownership. And the film was a 
her rip-off version, uh, what did she say, how did she pursue it, and, and so on. And that just gets them, gets them talking, gets them thinking. And from there, you can bring their experience of having spoken into the more formal bits of teaching that you need to do with them. But other people are in the book, and you can read about them in the book, are using musical instruments in class to teach copyright, are using art to teach intellectual property law. They're coming into the classroom with different things which, which the students might not expect in a law class. If I can add something to this, and more, more, more um, broadly, there, the, the 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 range of of, of teaching uh, tools is really uh, impressive in in the book. So we have um, the use of social media mm-hmm. um, for um, for IP uh, teaching. So you know, if if students can boil down a complex um, uh, concept into a limited number of characters um, that's, that already shows how well they've understood this concept as well as a great way of being able to communicating then uh, later on also with an audience that's not familiar with, with these I, IP uh, concepts and to break them down uh, into digestible um, um, uh, sentences. Um, there's also about um, uh, using a more um, empirical uh, research in IP teaching, which is, um, I think, really important for also preparing uh, uh, students uh, for the, the, their, their future uh, professional lives. They will be exposed, perhaps, to, to, to this kind of, of research, and it can be quite complex if you haven't uh, been exposed to it beforehand. So to be able to already deal with this during your, um, uh, your, your education um, uh, educational journey is really important. So that's uh, by uh, Smita uh, Keria. Um, but it's also about who is teaching um, IP. So there's a whole section also about, you know, um, um, involving uh, IP uh, professionals, such um, uh, as you've done, uh, Grillim, which is really important for, for, for students to hear it, uh, to hear about experiences from people who are uh, dealing with uh, these uh, situations on a daily basis and who can tell uh, more about a story because I really think that it all starts with telling a good story. It's being able to draw the students in, to find their motivation um, 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 of why they might be interested in a particular uh, topic to keep them engaged. And everything starts with a good story. So here for me, IP professionals are super important because they can tell part of the story that I will never be able to tell. If you're recruiting, I think there's lots of people out there who've got some really good stories that make it quite real interestingly when I was teaching that difficult class um, I was trying to think how am I going to you know how can I engage them Uh, and dry stuff about patentability and inventor step wasn't going to do it and I remember actually realizing that I might talk about something I get excited about believe it or not I think it's really interesting which is the telecom wars and the way that if it weren't for patents and all those wars our phones wouldn't it. So it's actually quite an interesting story. And when you, that was a good start. And everyone realizes that it affects their daily life. Yeah, finding those stories, that's interesting. If only there were an easy to digest, friendly, informative podcast that we could point people to. That's, that, that's talking of good ways of teaching, Lee. That's a good idea, isn't it? We could do, can we do one on plumbing as well? I feel like we've not done enough on that side. Well, there is a chapter in the book by Brian Fry who teaches with podcasts. Uh, but I just wanted to say, I think one of the, um, the hardest things as a, a law teacher, shifting from teaching law in the law school to teaching non-lawyers, is that you have to rid yourself of your own kind of um, rigour that you have a- applied to your own sort of learning about law and your application of law and so on, and put yourself in the mindset of where are these people coming from and where are they going to when they leave you. And I, while what Sabine was talking, I just sort of thought of the the Fortnite case, the Fortnite dance rapper whose dance moves were copied and was very incensed by this and sued and so on. Now the intricacies of arguing that case in a court are one thing, but if you show that to a student and who has no experience whatsoever and ask them what's their gut reaction, what do they feel, and then get them started, then they, you've got something to build on, you know, this will be decided with the, the, the rules of copyright and you've got something to, a backcloth to sort of 
place your copyright law against. Whereas if you started off by saying copyright and you've got no copyright in this because of that, you've lost them. So that's the the medium, as it were, and some fascinating channels there. And I think, yeah, I'm now getting quite excited about having a look at this book and come up with some ideas because one does <laughs> tend to, I mean, you know, I come from a blackboard era teaching, so yeah. using social media is not, it is not, was not, didn't mean, we made no sense that time we tried to teach me. Uh, can I just interject? Was your blackboard, yes. like my first blackboard, not not a fixed blackboard on a wall, but a rolly one? Oh, and that sounds quite modern. Yeah, because, because <laughs> the best thing about those, although obviously it's the worst way to teach, but it's the way I experienced it as a student, was um, a couple of our lecturers would get into the classroom, maybe about 10 minutes before the class would start, and would have three quarters filled the rolly blackboard. And then we'd just keep rolling it and writing and rolling it and writing. And you would just you would just keep writing the bit that kept coming up. And they and because they had started ten minutes earlier, there was there was always plenty there. It was um. Yeah, so you just took me you took me back to the early eighties, Gwilym. I do. I remember lecturing at SEPA in probably the nineties using an overhead projector and transparencies. That was... oh, I loved our HPs. Uh, mm. I agree, but I was, actually, just quick progress. I was the first person ever to use PowerPoint at SEPA. And I know that because I had to bring a projector and they didn't know what it was. And it was I, a... I, I was I was the first person teaching, certainly in the construction area at Highbury College in Portsmouth, where I taught, to make their um, transparencies using Letraset. Oh, that's fancy. That's 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 posh, that is. But so, so, we, We've so, drifted. You were going to ask a question. Well, no, it's, it was relevant. It's the, the medium, but the, the, just, just on the message, I think you, it's more about teaching techniques, as I understand it. But I mean... Presumably, there's some thought. You've got to put some thoughts into what you're going to tell these different audiences. Does that is that varying? Is there any any messaging on kind of the sort of information that people are most interested in, or is it mostly about the teaching techniques themselves? Well, if, if Sabine isn't jumping in, I don't. I would like that question clarified. What do you mean by messaging? Well, what what do you what what do we teach these people? What do we teach people in certain external industries about IP? For example, there's two kind of for me. There's a couple of key areas. One is um, watch out for other people's IP. Don't just go around ripping stuff off. Another yeah. one is understand if you've created something, then you can get huge value from it by using. I tell you chapter and verse where it comes up, up, but it certainly does. And I think one of the that's one of the areas I was. Um, uh, made very aware of in the three years being at uh, UAL, University of the Arts. Uh, and there the emphasis is ever so much on collaboration, very little on IP. And they have a tiny team struggling to get IP across some of the most creative people in the uh, in the country. And um, the message, I don't know, Sabine may have, a, well, you know, may correct me, or not make add to what I'm saying, but um, my message, always when I go into a new class is to think those people are going to leave me in a year or two years time and they'll be out in the world what do they really need they need first of all to keep storm I think confidentiality you know is a message and they need to know that they are what they do has worth and that contributes to their self-esteem what they do may well involve something somebody else has done and they need to be aware of that and when they're working together with somebody, what do they want to come out of it? And it's kind of those those sort of, in, in that kind of language, that my teaching is, is motivated. That kind of... Sorry, Ruth. I, I think Ruth is being uh, uh, modest uh, here because there is a, a contribution um, in, in, in the introduction by Ruth about... Um, what to cover in 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 non law law programs? So it's really about, uh, from what I I recall, and, and Ruth, you 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 might correct me here, um, about you know understanding exactly who is your audience and where are they going. So what will be the most important to them, uh, mm-hmm. and what do they need to know? So whether it's about to un- uh, first understand well what those uh, people have uh, created or invented, how to protect it and, um, and, and, and perhaps who to contact and the, 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 the limits to um, uh, the, the different uh, IP regimes um, um, uh, would be most important. But obviously that would be different from uh, the situation in a law school where there it's very much more about um, um, going into the, the details of the different IP uh, regimes um, and the different questions that are currently being raised. So um, here we're not trying to reproduce what the, the content of, of a textbook 
you're right in saying that it's much more about teaching techniques. Uh, it's much more about understanding uh, who you might find today in a classroom, because the classrooms have also very much uh, changed since uh, the 80s. So now the profile of the learners is much more diverse. They have a, a breadth of past experience that they're coming with in the classroom. And it's also while well, understanding this and maximizing on uh, those profiles that you have in the classroom to ensure that then you have a greater uh, value in, in the IP teaching, in the, I, well, in the learning journey throughout the year as well with, with, with the classroom that you have in front of you. So it's very much a, a two-way um, street here where it's not about the lecturer uh, the IP educator simply delivering content, but it's really trying to um, uh, learn also from, from your classroom what they are interested in, what their past experiences are, and build on the different kind of motivations you can then identify. Yeah, and, and, and I think well, uh, another um, aspect is uh, in my teaching, I've made a transition <laughs> over the years from feeling that I'm the person responsible for providing the answers to I am the person responsible for helping them to ask questions. And I think when if this if I can leave the students in the feeling that they are they know where to ask the questions or how to start to ask questions, then I've done the job. And you know, a module that I teach, I don't know about um, it, the law school modules are, are longer, but the longest I've been teaching over recent years is uh, 11 weeks of um, 11 two hour sessions. And you can't expect someone to know all about intellectual property in that period of time. You can only expect them to understand sort of um, the very basic concepts that they can build extra knowledge on, but you can work with them to think in terms of asking questions. Um, and that can be reflected in the uh, assessment that, uh, that you set. And we've got chapters in the book that discuss assessments. So that, you know, that, that too is sort of part of the message. Thank you. And I think the kind of the focus on the audience is um, makes a lot of sense. You know, you've got to get the right message to the right people. Out of interest, talking of audiences. So who is the audience for the book? Who, who, who is this book aimed at? Who should be reading it? Well, whoever should, who should be reading it is anybody who is going to stand um, in front of people wanting to know about intellectual property. I know that WIPO are re uh, recommending it for all their MA, you know, the people who do their masters in, in, in IP education. And we would hope that people who run libraries, which are, are used by IP teachers, will stock it. And that people who are teach, going to teach uh, intellectual property and increasingly in the law school, the law school teachers who might never before have bothered with teaching outside the law school are being drawn into um, programs that are in other faculties and that increases the income for the the law school increases the work of the law school teacher and so hopefully they will find something of value in it you may even you I don't know who, who else would want to read it ah uh, yeah I think you're right it's a, anyone who's interested in IP uh, education you know may it be in in the law school in the for those who are um, about to teach outside the law school, but also those who simply want to uh, reflect on their teaching practices and want to uh, maybe try uh, new things in their teaching. Um, and instead of, uh, of, of starting everything from scratch, well, there are some really uh, neat ideas and a how to um, a, a how to integrate uh, these ideas within their teaching, yeah. and then obviously people outside the law school who might have to teach uh, IP and never done it before. Then where do you start? Well, um, this book is uh, telling them how to hopefully. Right, and I think certainly if um, if CEPA were to make you know publicize it amongst its uh, membership and um, SITMA as well and. Uh, along with the message that there are universities begging, I'm sure, for input from practitioners in the locality who can add some richness and colour to intellectual property. And lastly, but another um, uh, area, uh, there is a growing, a small but growing number of people in faculties other than law 
realizing perhaps hearing it from their students that they should be including something on intellectual property but they don't know where to begin nobody ever taught them would pick up a book like this and perhaps have the courage to stand up in front of their own students uh, for a few hours and tell them about intellectual property i'm conscious of time but i've got a couple of questions so sort of prompted by Grillam's focus on audience. So Grillam's talked about multiple audiences, students as audience, in terms of the recipients of the learning that comes out of the book, academics as audience, in terms of those people who would read the book to inform their own teaching. Can I talk a little bit about the contributors? You've got quite a cast of contributors, um, essayists, I think would be the, the proper term for them, um, including some of the great and good notable characters in IP. I'm not going to say who I think are the great and good, by the way, in case I offend anybody that I don't mention. But, uh, but there are some prominent names there. How did you assemble your cast? Well, it was a, a mix of different mediums that we used uh, for, for, for this purpose. Firstly, we used a series of mailing lists, whether it was through the EIPT, EIPTN network that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, we've also advertised it on the uh, IPCAT uh, blog. Um, and we uh, also, well, we, through the years, we had met uh, some of these uh, contributors and have heard about uh, their innovative uh, teaching techniques that we thought we were interesting. So we've um, also given uh, the opportunity to uh, send in an abstract. And then once we had received all the um, the interest for for this project, we then went through them and so and and tried to identify what would work best as a, a collection. From my perspective, two pe- two contributors who are not academics but um, make a fantastic contribution. We persuaded to write uh, chapters for the book, which were Mandy Haberman, who has her long-standing uh, history of innovation and struggles with the IP um, system, and Agatha Michelle de Katzot, who is a current, who's currently an IP lawyer, a patent um, lawyer in London, and has been working alongside me uh, as my tutorial assistant, which I'm hugely grateful. And she gives a, a, a wonderful perspective on uh, the contribution she feels that she makes uh, to the development of the students that we teach. Um, and last but not least, we did persuade the patent office that uh, they should be there as well, because they make a, a great contribution through their resources to uh, IP teachers. And um, they agreed and they have a chapter. That's where the writers came from. So, so maybe a final question for me, terribly unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's my job to do this. If I give you three nuggets each, a nugget being an absolute gem that you sort of picked up in your um in your work on this what would what would be your individual three nuggets what would you say wow wasn't expecting to find that or so glad i saw this uh three three nuggets you don't have to have three if there's only one or two then just go for one or two well for me to to read about uh, somebody who actually takes um uh, musical instruments into the classroom and gets the students uh to understand their um IP teaching through music and the uh, contribution from Joe Secon in Portsmouth. Portsmouth, who, yeah, no Joe, yeah. Yes, who works with social media. Um, I find that, uh, you know, I found that uh, unexpected. To, to uh, although I'd heard about it, I actually, actually to read it, I found it uh, fascinating. And Sabine's contribution on video games, you know, it's it's transition from board game to, you know, the gaming principle generally as being a way of teaching. Again, something I'd heard about from Korea, but sort of seeing it in the flesh as something I don't think I will ever be using myself, but to uh, think that this is the way teaching is progressing what you know what's not to like very exciting I guess for me the first one will be like a general nugget if that's okay um in the sense that there's there's quite a, a lot of innovation and I, I I think the innovation the amount of innovation in IP teaching I didn't expect so the, for me that was a uh, really uh, excellent to see because it made me uh, think about where I would want to see my own uh, practice go uh, later on so um also by uh, merging some of the contributions together so there's 
uh, Caroline uh, a calls talking about uh, virtual reality and uh, Haley Busher talking about low clinics and you know being able to merge these two together would also widen participation and would be a, a, an excellent uh, 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 thing in the future um, in my personal opinion so that would be my my first nugget is uh, is the amount uh, of innovation that there is in there the second one uh, would be about uh, using more empirical methods, which I really think is uh, is really important in in uh, in IP education for 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 you know uh, their their professional uh, routes uh, later on. And this is kind of uh, also you know doubling the challenge. You've got to be able to teach IP, which is already uh, a complex, but also have to teach about methods and you know having to deal with with data. Um, and and Smita Keria really gives a great uh, how to uh, in in her contribution. My final nugget would be for uh, Andrea Wallace um, and her way of using arts uh, in in the law school in in IP education because here it's really about um, reversing the roles and that gives really a rounded uh, approach uh, to to IP to for 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 the students by putting them in the shoes of creators uh, and and then having to extract the IP uh, challenges sure. um, that that derive yeah. from there. I see that, yeah. yeah. And can I get crave the uh, um, editable indulgence of an, uh, a fourth? Of a, what for a fourth? Of a fourth. Yeah. For a fourth, because it takes me a little while to catch up every so often. And the fourth really would be that the book talks about ethics, IP, and ethics, and IP and sustainability, and IP. Uh, in the context, not just of your career and not just of what you're going to do with it, but but how you're going to work with it. And um, Janice Denencourt uh, is not the only person who, who writes about uh, the ethical dimension to, to intellectual property. I think that's something since the pandemic, since the murder of George Floyd, uh, we've all had to look at in a, in a different way. And I think the, the book is one of the first sort of generalists. There are specific books about uh, IP and ethics, but it's the first sort of generalist IP text that raises the challenge of teaching uh, IP ethical, the ethical dimensions to IP. I think, yeah, thanks for that, Ruth. That's a great share, actually. Um, well, thank you both so much for coming on. It's been absolutely lovely having you with us. See, I in the in the preamble, I did talk about time. We've gone over time, but that's clearly because there was plenty to talk about. Um, and Gwilym, I can't think of a closing question. <laughs> if only if only there was someone who had a closing question. Oh, Lee, that's beautiful. You're such a pro. Thank you. I've actually got five closing questions because <laughs> um, there's some really interesting stuff come up. We can choose from any of the followings. If you could choose one micro vocational teaching topic on something you're good at, what would you choose? If you could teach something through a board game, what would it be? What's your best snippet for an IP icebreaker? What would you do if you sat next to someone who you noticed was infringing your IP? And what musical instrument would you use to teach intellectual property? Uh, are the ones I've come up with from this. Not bad. You're going to have to give discussion. us just one of those. The <laughs> first one. Uh, what What would your micro vocational teaching topic be? Any Anything in your whole life, you've got five minutes to teach people about something you love, you're passionate about and you're really good at. Starting with you, Lee. And it better not be about bloody washers. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to come to me first. That was I, ne I never do that to you. Oh, I do actually. You do it every time. <laughs> I just don't realise I'm doing it at the time. Oh, wow. Well. No, no I, I can't use my ball valve now, can I? No, um, that, that would be terribly unfair. So probably it would have to be something maybe fishing related. That's so I would yeah. I would probably do tying a hook or something like that, because I think you can make quite a lot out of that. You can kind of talk bait. You can talk tying techniques. Um, you can talk line strengths, casting. There's there's a lot you could get into five minutes. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I would go to hobby fishing, tying a hook. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, if it has to be outside of intellectual properties, that's what you're asking. Yeah, for. go on. Let's let's open up our lives. How yes. to make filter fish? How to what? Sorry. How to make a filter fish? It's a oh. classic old East European, yes, uh, Jewish Polish recipe that uh, started off as mint fish stuffed inside a carp, but has trans for, um, formed over the ages to a ball of uh, minced fish and flavorings and it's called the filter fish google it 
I'm going to Lee, we have a podcast coming up, which is IP celebrities tell us their favorite recipe. Recipes, yeah. How cool would that be? Pleasure. Pleasure. There's a book in that. A book of essays. Sabine. Um, well, I guess uh, for me, it would be uh, landscape photography because that's my hobby. So oh, cool. um, I love to get up very early in the morning and stay late at night to take photographs. <laughs> oh, no, so far, I, did, I, did, I even attend Lee's hook tying one out of these so far. Do you mind before Lee asks? So mine, because I love having the benefit. If you come up with the question, you can get the answer sorted early, which is good. Exactly it would, right. Yeah, it would, it would, it would be down, how to make quite a good sturdy hat from a sheet of broadsheet newspaper. What? What like like the folding up things that we used to make as children, the the tripods yeah. and stuff like that. No, but my, they're, way, they're Michael, don't they? way way better than that. Proper proper decorators hat. You, you're going to have to do it. You now need to bring newspapers to the next podcast, and I want to see this. I'm very proud of it. It's genuinely quite a sturdy piece of kit as well. There we go. Can I can I ask a question? Who's the audience of the podcast? Oh, we don't have one. This right. is it. Just just us. <laughs> No, it's 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 most it's mostly people who love fishing, landscape photography, cookery, and hat making. So this is amazing how it's panned out. We we have a mixed audience. I mean, it's mainly our members, obviously, but we have an audience outside of that. People who are interested generally in IP, listening. Uh, we're quite we're quite well worldly travelled now, Gwilym, aren't we? The stats show us that people listen in Australia and across Europe and America and a little bit in Asia and stuff. So um, it, it, it is a good question, Lee. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but what, 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 we, what we do like is we do like our, the guests that we have on to then use their podcast and put that put it out through their networks. Yes, it'll be on the iPad networks. Yeah, because then hopefully that kind of extends our audience. And I, and I imagine, I'm going back to the point earlier on, that um, actually this is not a bad podcast in and of itself. For teaching IP, there's all sorts of little bits you could direct students or those teaching IP at. Um, we'll keep all of this in because it's good stuff. But we've reached hard stop. We're at 11 o'clock. I'm going to have to bring us to a close. Thank you both so much for coming on. It's been lovely, lovely talking to you. Um, and um, you. We'll, we'll let you know when the podcast will go out. We're at the very early stages of season eight. 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 Season eight, yeah. Um, and this is second one in the bag. So it'll be out in the next week or two. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank you. That was great. I'll see you on Thursday, Gwilym. <laughs> of course. Bye. 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 <laughs>